Enrico Baccarini and I'm a cultural anthropologist and for many years, I would say almost 20 years, I've been studying the East, especially India, which for one reason or another has always fascinated me. Above all because it's a land we know for its spirituality, for many traditions that have arrived in the West, which have often been modified or manipulated with respect to their origins. But there are so many historical mysteries that especially concern this subcontinent, and by searching over the years since I was very young, I couldn't find explanations for them. So, over time, studying also at a university level, outside of university, I tried to investigate personally, to study the official texts, to study the translations that have been made for more than two centuries by mainly the English and the Germans. And I've been there as many times as I could to try to understand with my own eyes, to personally experience what the charm is, what the mystery is of these lands, and above all the many traditions, which have been slowly filtering into the West for no more than about 15 or 20 years. So it's a journey that I've been following for many years. Obviously, it's a journey that will never end, because even today we discover things about many civilizations on the planet that we didn't know 100 or even 50 years ago. So it's an understanding and a rediscovery of what our history is, the history of humanity, especially of lands that are extremely distant from us. I have focused mainly on India, but if we also look at Japan, at China or Indonesia, there really are many territories that have yet to reveal their history. Regarding the East and India in particular, a common mistake that we make as Westerners, and this is probably also due to the legacy of the dominations, the various dominations that India has experienced, from the Portuguese to the Arabs and the English above all, we have concepts that were brought to us in the West or that arrived in the West that are very filtered or mistaken. Yoga, for example, that you will see or be able to see in rare cases because it's not performed publicly in India, it's not the yoga that with Vivekananda came to the West towards the end of the 19th century. So we have studied and we have learned about the East with eyes that are not always genuine, that almost always do not provide us with truthful information about its history and its past. If we, for example, look at the most ancient history of the Indian Territory, very few, almost nobody, will know what is called the Harappan Civilization or the Valinda Civilization. It's a civilization that, for example, in Italy, is almost not studied in schools at all, except in the last few years, where there are perhaps two or three lines in history books. But it's a civilization that was fundamental, very important, also for what would have been the development of other civilizations that followed. Historically, it's placed around 3000 to 3500 BC, and to date, around 1056 cities have been found, archaeological remains that are mainly in Pakistan, so you can understand how it isn't easy to excavate or investigate there. But what has already been understood since the mid-19th century by casually rediscovering the Harappan civilization is that it was a truly immense civilization. It's estimated that the Sumerians, around 2500 BC, were a population of around 300 to 400,000 inhabitants. The Valinda were 5 million. It was discovered in about a century and a half that they were very skilled navigators, very skilled traders who had created cities in ancient times, such as Mohenjo-daro, which in 2500 BC had a population of about 100,000 inhabitants, comparable to a city in Mexico, a modern-day Istanbul, therefore cities that have 20 or more million inhabitants, and there was a truly unique level of expertise. The question that arises is, where did this civilization come from? Archaeologists still don't know. It appeared practically almost out of nowhere, between 4000 and 3500 BC, 
had its evolution and then between approximately 2000 and 1700 BC disappeared. We don't know what happened to it, at least on an official level. There are some hypotheses, but it disappears completely and a few centuries later, about four to five hundred years later, the real history of India will begin with the Vedic civilization. Taking a small step backwards, however, to understand how much we do not know the history of these territories, if we move for a moment to present-day Pakistan, in Balochistan, which is that mountain range between Pakistan and Afghanistan, we find that there are some settlements. One of the most important, if not the most important, is called Megar, which are dated by official archaeology to 8,500, if not 9,000 BC. And the urban structure is obviously much smaller. The social urban structure of this city, or of these cities in Balochistan, totally recalls the history and the evolution of the subsequent Valinda civilization. This makes us understand how in those territories not only there are myths similar to more Western myths, such as the myth of the flood of the Old Testament, we also find it in those territories, but how there is an untold story, a story yet to be discovered, a story that delves into eras even more remote than what we all perhaps studied and learned about in school. The Egyptians date back to 3000-3300 BC, the Sumerians supposedly 4000-4300 BC. Among other things, there was an important Sumerologist scholar who passed away a few years ago, Giovanni Pettinato, Italian, an academic professor who was the first to propose a quite heretical thesis, stating that the intelligentsia, therefore the cream of the Sumerian religion, even of the aristocracy, probably, from his point of view, could have come from the Valinda civilization. So this civilization, to most people, could be one of, if not the oldest, in human history, and has yet to reveal almost everything about its history. Consider, for example, that its writing still remains undeciphered, and this writing was already seen at the beginning of the 20th century to be very similar, if not identical, to the Rongo Rongo writing of Easter Island, which is at least 18,000 kilometers away. There are also genetic analyses carried out in 2013 in Germany at the Max Planck Institute that demonstrated that in Northern Australia, there are some Aboriginal tribe populations that have genetic markers that come directly from the Valinda civilization. So, around 2300 to 2400 BC, and we are talking about more than 4000 years ago, someone reached the north of Australia by boat. This should make us understand how much we don't know about human history. We know a small fragment of the history that concerns us, and if I may, it's almost always filtered through the eyes of the West, but there's still a lot to discover. The incredible thing is that these ancient civilizations need to also explain to us how they were born from nothing, already progressed, already advanced, and the Valinda civilization is one of these. With an urbanization, with a social system, and also laws and regulations that we know very little about, but which was already advanced and evolved when there were the first traces of this civilization, of the Harappan civilization, in India. And here, a whole series of traditions can be inserted, not only of a religious and mythological nature, which concern the subsequent Indian people, which is obviously a continuation of the Valinda civilization. And they tell us about these beings, they call them divinities, who come, they themselves say it clearly without any problem, even from other planets, that manifested themselves in those areas of northern India, and whose role was almost always to bring civilization, to teach culture, for example, the rudiments of agriculture or astronomical observation. 
And obviously, we judge these themes, these subjects, with profane eyes as just mythology, a legend that this people created to justify everything that will come afterwards. In reality, if we extend our gaze to China, to the Sumerians, to the Egyptians, we see how there are so many civilizations on planet Earth that since the most remote times tell us about these civilizers, of these divine beings, who at a certain moment appear and bring this knowledge to improve humanity, to make it progress to higher, more advanced levels. The Sumerians had the Abkalu, who were half men, half fish beings, who during the day, in the most ancient eras of their myths of their history, we could say in the morning, came out of the water and taught astronomy, mathematics, cultivation and irrigation to the Sumerians. And then, in the evening, the myths on the cuneiform tablets tell us, they returned to the water, and for a very long period, they assisted humans in the government of earthly things. We find the same thing in China, where we have Fuxi and Nuwa, two figures who are also linked to the Chinese flood. We find it in South America, Quetzalcoatl, and we also find it in India, with a whole series of deities and characters who also had this purpose. Then obviously, over the centuries, and I would even say millennia, Indian philosophy, mythography and mythology has also been embellished with divinities who came or manifested themselves because they were in love with a man or a woman, and therefore there are also these stories. But if we read the Rig Veda or other texts of Indian antiquity, such as the Upanishads and many others, we see how there is a component of these texts that certainly belongs to a people, and tells the story of a people, but there is also a whole series of data, details and information that escape our understanding. And which today, through the eyes of modern individuals, we could say are technological and scientific data, that these peoples absolutely could not have possessed, unless some advanced individual had given them this data, or they had instruments or machinery capable of allowing them to do certain calculations. And here I speak, for example, of the calculation of the speed of light, which in India was done in very ancient times by Kanada, who well before the Greeks was the one who theorized the existence of atoms, and therefore that the entire creation was composed of these elements, these microscopic particles, which then gradually aggregated to create matter. If we read the Bhagavata Purana, the Bhagavad Gita, we read, as we have clearly been told within these texts, that we live in a universe. But there are infinite universes, in which, according to one of the most important traditions, Vishnu, when the world that we know was created, created infinite parallel worlds, and entered each of them to bring life. So you can see how in the Indian world, there are concepts since the most remote antiquity that we have only acquired after centuries, after millennia, in some cases, many cases, between 1600 and 1700 AD, with the Enlightenment movement, and therefore technological progress and advanced tools. Another fundamental fact is that in texts such as the Padma Purana, but also in many other texts, even in the Rig Veda itself, it is said, for the Indian world, for what it will become after Hinduism, the question does not arise whether the cosmos is inhabited. The cosmos is inhabited. Buloka, which is what we call planet Earth, for them is one of an infinite number of planets that host life, obviously various types of life forms. In the Padma Purana, it is even said that only in our galaxy alone, because there was already the concept of galaxy in Indian antiquity, which they defined with the Sanskrit term Shish Umar, in our galaxy alone, according to the Padma Purana, there would be 400,000 species similar to man. So perhaps they were taller, shorter, their skin was blue or green or of any color, but such a concept already existed long before the Greeks, 
who also hypothesized the possibility of an inhabited cosmos. But by giving numbers, establishing that there are at least 400,000 species similar to the human one is something incredible, as the Padma Purana was put into written form more or less in 800 BC. First of all, because today it is easy to say these things. It seems almost banal. In that era, let's try for a moment to put ourselves in that perspective, in that era it was something impossible, because there was no way of reasoning similar to the modern one, that is the result of scientific advancement and knowledge. At that time, already thinking that the lights we see in the sky were stars, and that these stars could obviously metaphorically have planets close to them, and that these could be inhabited, and that there were other forms of life, was something disconcerting in the Indian world, also the most ancient. But this concept exists, and we find it in what will later become their sacred texts. Because yesterday, as today, today less and less, unfortunately, due to our relativism, which is leading to the loss of this type of tradition, in India, as in other peoples, such as, for example, among the Druids, knowledge, uh, knowledge which in Sanskrit is called Veda, was transmitted only orally and monomically. So, from master to disciple, knowledge was transmitted in very particular, codified ways, so that it was not possible to alter the concepts, the knowledge as such, and this knowledge was carried forward from master to disciple, from mouth to ear, as they have always done over the centuries. Then, for a whole series of reasons, especially the birth of Buddhism in the 5th and 6th century BC, these texts began to be put into written form. But also here, the Indian world tells us that this knowledge is a heritage that they have possessed for thousands of years. And they themselves say, for example, that yoga is more than 6,000 years old. They say that before this civilization, on this world in which we live, there have been at least four other civilizations that, for one reason or another, have been destroyed, and that they are the survivors of the last civilization, and that they preserved some of this knowledge by bringing it into what is the current civilization. And this isn't so strange, because if you take the Manu Smriti, the laws of Manu, which is one of the texts where the Indian flood is spoken of, it clearly states how Manu, their Noah, following a series of events, builds a boat and saves particular figures, who are the seven wise men, the Saptarishi, those who must preserve knowledge. And Manu also saves seeds, plants, other men and women, and these figures will become those who will have to recreate civilization when the waters recede. And here too, the curious thing is that in the Indian world, these events are placed precisely in a certain historical period, which approximately is our 10,000 BC, which is an interesting historical period, because it is in this period that, for example, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey was covered. Gobekli Tepe is the oldest temple of humanity, and paleoclimatology, therefore official science, tells us that the last glaciation ends in this historical period. Therefore, the enormous mass of ice that was present on a good part of the planet, in the north of the planet, in some cases that reached two if not three kilometers in thickness, melts, and this enormous quantity of water pours into the seas, obviously raising the sea level. Which led, for example, in India to an increase in marine levels between 120 and 140 meters, in other areas of the planet less, between 70, 90 or 100 meters. But on the one hand, this explains to us what could be the genesis of the various flood myths that we find all over the planet, and to date there have been more than 650 of them. On the other hand, however, it can justify many traditions about a flood, and also justify the possibility of a civilization preceding ours with technological knowledge and a wisdom that could be said to be much more advanced than what we have believed up to now. <laughs>
All this, however, does not exclude those that are other texts that talk about beings, divinities. Some of these are Narada Muni, the Kumaras, who, according to Indian traditions, were beings who came to our planet, Buloka, to bring teachings, which could be more technical. So, civilization in the practical sense, irrigation, construction, in other cases, more spiritual teachings, therefore, concepts aimed at elevating the people who received them, and the Indian world is full of these figures. Consider that the Indian deities are called Devas, and Deva in Sanskrit literally means enlightened being, in the sense that a superior being is enlightened not only by spirituality but also by knowledge, a superior being who obviously teaches a being we would define as inferior, the, the people of ancient India, what the right paths are to follow to evolve in a way that is not self-destructive. Then, the Indian epics also tell us and teach us how there were good devas and bad devas, how they fought each other, how these devas, these divinities, like many other peoples, had to use means of transport, to travel or to wage war, and these means of transport or vehicles are called vimana. These vimanas are basically well, today we could compare them to flying vehicles that were used not only by humans, this to a much lesser extent, but by the devas, to move around our planet and to move, as they say, from location to location, therefore from planet to planet. These two are conceptions that perhaps for us modern men, men of science who must verify everything, they may seem absurd but if we look at the Indian sacred texts, if we look at their epics, their philosophy and their religion, we can find many references to these Vimanas. To the point that, up until 10 to 15 years ago, the existence of these Vimanas was questioned by saying, yes, they are mythographic constructions like Apollo's chariot that flew in the sky. Then a whole series of texts were rediscovered where they talk in detail about these Vimanas. We possess barely 5% of the knowledge from the Indian world that has been translated into English or German. So this 95% that remains, either in Sanskrit or as an oral tradition not yet put into written form, is a world, a universe that is truly to be discovered. However, some of these texts are truly emblematic because some of them tell us, the Samarangana Sutradhara comes to mind, some of their names are also unpronounceable. This is a text from 1051-1052 AD, commissioned by a Maharaja, that is, by a great ruler, Boja, who, seeing how the knowledge of his kingdom was slowly being lost, began to send a whole series of emissaries throughout his kingdom to transcribe, to preserve this knowledge, and the result is a book that can still be found today, also translated into English, the Samarangana Sutradhara. And the curious thing is that it is a text mainly about architecture. The curious thing about this text is that it states, in the 32nd chapter, which is more than 140 pages long, it tells of how in the most ancient times of India there were aircraft that flew like birds, which moved in the sky, which also moved outside what is the atmosphere. Here it is called in a different way, but there is, in this text as in others from ancient India, a concept that is very current for us, much more modern, that is, of an atmosphere that surrounds our planet, various levels of atmosphere, and then what we define as deep space. So this text talks about the atmosphere in 1051 AD, about aircraft that could also be equipped with a certain type of weapons to be used in battle. But this chapter of the Samarangana Sutradhara specifies right at the beginning that not all the information can be given or provided to the reader. Let's say because some of it would be extremely dangerous if it fell into the wrong hands. <laughs> 
It could, in the hands of an evil person, generate death, destruction and wars. Therefore, the author who transcribed this knowledge in the Samarangana Sutradhara from the most important knowledge provides the most emblematic and interesting parts of it. And then what happens? Well, about 15 years ago, there were a series of Indian university professors who asked themselves the question, partly for fun and partly out of a quirky curiosity, let's see if some of this knowledge, which is very technical in this chapter, is genuine, is truthful. And one of these professors, Professor Sharon, who was then a professor of nanotechnology at the University of Bombay, then he became principal and later retired, tried to reconstruct one of the various machines described in the Samarangana Sutradhara. But there are also other texts that speak in a technical and precise way regarding the Vimanas. And so, using cutting-edge tools for that period, 15 years ago, he accurately followed the description in the book, and what he found himself in front of once he had recreated the Chumbak Mani, which was, let's say, the machine he had chosen to see whether it was real or not, was something rather disconcerting. Because he also realized, based on the descriptions in the text, that what he had created was a solar panel, a liquid photovoltaic cell. Therefore, it was a liquid that if subjected to agitated movement and sunlight, generated electric current. And this, in itself, in a text from 1051 AD, is something futuristic. Just think that liquid solar panels do not exist today, and the first ones were tested and built in Japan approximately between 1971 and 1972. So we have a text that is almost 1000 years old, that technically presents a procedure for reconstructing something that perhaps today we would barely able to recreate. This, for me, obviously in my opinion, is solid proof that this culture, this people, this reality that perhaps we know more on a spiritual level, had and possesses a whole series of truly cutting-edge knowledge. Other examples of materials based or recreated from these ancient texts are, for example, those that today we would define as stealth materials, therefore capable of being invisible to radar, very light and at the same time very resistant materials. There are many texts, one of the most famous is what is known by the name of Vimanika Shastra. The Vimanika Shastra has been contested more or less since it was written, but especially in the last 20 years, because it has always been said that Subaraya Shastri, the Brahmin, the Pandit who popularized it, was either a scammer or a character who wanted to make money. In fact, he died very poor. In reality, he was the last in an initiatory chain, and there is historical evidence that demonstrates this in a series of knowledge that he dictated to his adopted son, who was also his disciple, and which his son transcribed in 24 notebooks, which are still today in Baroda in southern India. The Vimanika Shastra is not channeled, as it has always been heard and written about, but is a text that is part of an initiatory chain of knowledge, transmitted from mouth to ear. And also, the Vimanika Shastra is also a text from which technologies and everything else that have been recreated in the last 10 years have been drawn. Among other things, there are scientific publications, some of which I also participated in, and also patents, filed in India, Germany, England and the United States, which draw precisely on these texts. Obviously, this is not spoken about. It's knowledge that remains in a corner. There are many questions regarding the Vimanas. What were they? How did they work? What could they do? Well, from what has been reconstructed through the various texts, we know that at least 59 different types of Vimanas are listed. Some, for example, only allowed you to carry two people, and a story, an emblematic legend, is that of the Marut brothers, who were two twin brothers, who saved an individual who was about to drown in the sea. They take their Vimana, their small Vimana, which can only hold two people, 
They arrive in the middle of the ocean, they save this person by placing him as best as possible on their Vimana and then they return home, thus saving the life of this person. There are also other Vimanas, such as the one Rama uses in the Ramayana at the end of the epic poem, which allows him, and here they are called flying palaces, they allow Rama to carry his entire army, therefore estimated at at least a few hundred individuals, if not more, and the description given, as you can see, is that of a very wide variety, at least 59 different types of Vimana, which, according to Indian tradition, existed in very ancient times. By very ancient times, we mean before the history as we know it today, because the Indians themselves tell us that these aircraft stopped flying more or less between 3000 and 4000 BC. But everything that is told in the Ramayana and in the Mahabharata are much more ancient events, which can be dated between 10,000 and even before that, BC. And it's interesting to see how attempts have been made to recreate these technologies, in many cases successful. Obviously, many times the information is partial, many times we do not have the knowledge to even understand what the texts say, because perhaps they call certain elements in a different way from what we call them today. But in many cases, we have managed to recreate something interesting. The question that is almost always asked very often is, would we be able to rebuild a Vimana? No. Are there any pieces of Vimana or something like that that have been preserved? No. That is officially known, no. But personally, I think that if we have texts available that are even only from 1000 AD, so not even 1000 years ago, some are much older, already these texts that tell us certain stories provide us certain details and go to a level of expertise and technicalities that today we could only have in certain cases. Already for me, this is indirect, but also direct proof of what this people has preserved, of what this people has perhaps handed down over the course of time. And obviously, alongside this knowledge, those devas are linked to all this, those figures who also arrived on our planet, and who, in many cases, fought among themselves. The Vimanas could also be equipped with weapons, even very deadly weapons. In general, the weapons of the Vimanas are called Tejas Astra. Astra means weapon. Tejas basically means energy. It can be translated as fire. The Tejas is also the internal fire that a practitioner of an Indian discipline has when he feels that he is about to awaken. But generally, the translation is energy, internal energy. Therefore, Tejas Astras literally means energy weapons, with everything that this term can or wants to mean. And in the Mahabharata, which is perhaps the greatest epic poem and the oldest in human history, it tells of the last 18 days of a battle that was fought between two rival factions, who were basically related to each other. There were the Pandavas, who were, let's say, the good guys, and the Kauravas, who were labelled as bad, and Arjuna, who is the main figure of this poem, who Krishna advises in the Bhagavad Gita, which is a piece of the Mahabharata, in which Krishna provides teachings to Arjuna, including that of yoga. But there is also a part of the Mahabharata where it is told how Arjuna is taken from the battlefield. He is carried on board Avimana. And there is his direct story. He says, I see the Vimana rising, going higher and higher. And he sees the elephants that were used in battle transform like ants, as small as ants. He sees his enormous army transform into an indistinct expanse of colors and shapes. Then he tells us that this Vimana leaves our planet and for a fairly long period it travels in what we would define as space until it arrives in the artificial city, thus called Svaga 
of the god Indra. He arrives inside it, but before entering with the Vimana that took him inside Indraloka, the flying city of Indra, this the Mahabharata tells us, and this can be confirmed by taking any version of it in Italian or English, Arjuna recounts how he sees tens of thousands of Vimanas entering or leaving Indraloka, or stationed in its vicinity. So, here too, it feels like we are reading a science fiction novel or watching a science fiction film, but it is an extremely ancient text, the very ancient Mahabharata from at least the 3rd or 4th century BC, but it was a previous oral tradition. He enters Indraloka and after a series of events, Indra gives him some weapons, explains to him how to use these weapons, because without adequate teaching in the hands of the wrong person, they could have killed Arjuna and also his army. And this obviously presents some parallels. It seems a bit like modern times, how you obviously have to learn to hold a rifle or to shoot a missile. These are obvious comparisons to what we have today regarding modern technology. And then Arjuna learns the use of these Teja Astra, goes back and by using them in battle, he will ultimately win the war. They are traditions, they are stories which, at least personally, but not only for me, differ totally from the story of the Trojan horse or other Nordic myths, where there are also very interesting elements. But here there is a technological component, I would say, and I take full responsibility for it very strongly, a component that today we can read, rightly or wrongly, as a component behind which there existed a procedure, a technology or a science. But in that era it was impossible to invent such a thing, as if the ancient Romans had imagined they had created the myth of what today is a tablet or a cell phone, that is, if you haven't seen it, if you don't know that it can exist or that it could exist, you can't imagine such a thing. So the Indian world is very rich in these elements. They are obviously very circumstantial, but there are so many of them that so much circumstantial evidence, at least for me, leads to real proof. At the level of drawings or sculptures, however, even here we have very few elements. The Vimanas are represented very few times. In the temples of that time, the Vimana is represented as a flying temple or a flying cart. In southern India, there is a whole series of beautiful frescoes in various cities, including Puri, where you can see the Vimanas, which are like two overlapping discs, a bit like flying saucers, as they used to be called in the 40s and 50s, with some spheres under them. And in this case, there are these frescoes near Puri, which are dated back to at least 1400-1500 AD. Therefore, although in an era very close to us, a form that is totally impossible and incomprehensible in that era, in that place, as well as in any other part of the planet. Another interesting fact is that the Samarangana Sutradhara, this architectural text which talks about Vimana, tells us that at the Vastu level, Vastu is Indian architecture. Obviously, there is always a religious and spiritual component, so Vastu is not just the art of building a temple, a house or a palace, but it is done a bit like Feng Shui comes to mind. It is done according to certain standards, certain proportions, with a teaching behind it that has strong spiritual components. But the Samarangana Sudradhara and the Vastu in general tells us how, especially in southern India, the highest part of the temple, which normally has a disc-shaped aspect, it looks like a real disc, that part on an architectural level is called Vimana. It's the term with which the last part of the temple is architecturally designated, which is the point that connects the earthly part, the man who is in the temple, with the divine part. And this makes us understand how certain knowledge has also filtered down into the most common fields, such as architecture and so on. Then obviously 
there are an infinite number of legends concerning the Vimanas and also something technological which, for example, was then attributed to certain deities and this technological something, for example, is Shiva who, in certain cases, to move somewhere else or return to his celestial spheres, uses what is called the Jyotalinga. The Jyotalinga is a sort of cone of fire, a cone of light that envelops Indra and takes him away, taking him beyond the human plane, we could say, using more religious terms. It's obvious that this, together with many other pieces of information, have been read by many scholars, by many researchers, through a more technological perspective, and there are many small pieces that seem to create a much broader, much more extensive and defined picture, telling us that in India, in ancient India, as well as territories even in the Far East, there was knowledge impossible to obtain, except by hypothesizing that in a certain way it really was the heritage of a previous civilization. But in certain cases, they themselves tell us that it was a heritage of cultural knowledge and wisdom that had been donated by these deities to the various sadhu, to the various wise men who in ancient times had had the good fortune to meet them. Well, my opinion is that there is this big difference between us, precisely because we are talking about distant cultures. This doesn't mean different. They are two ways of facing and approaching life, philosophy, spirituality and religion in a totally different way. An example could be the pariahs, who are those who are in the lowest caste, the untouchables. It's obvious that in India they have the will to improve their living conditions, but they will never make the effort as a westerner would, because, according to their religion, they say, if I was born in the lowest caste, it means I deserved my karmic debt. I did extremely negative gestures, actions and things. So today I deserve to be in this condition now. And yes, I can improve, but it's pointless for me to try too hard. A concept that we in the West would never have. Today, if I'm in a disadvantaged condition, I will do everything I can, honestly, even dishonestly, to try to survive as best I can and improve myself. They are two ways of, for me this is my opinion, two ways of approaching life, philosophy and religion in a different way. It's difficult to generalize, in the sense that in Egypt, for example, there was a priestly caste that had power and held that power, it held it for thousands of years, 2000 years at least. And then we consider Akhenaten, who wanted to create a monotheistic cult, in which instead of many divinities, there was only one, a cult, and his images were destroyed, his figure was banished from history. The Jewish faith is not my field, but the Jewish people, in Jewish texts, we talk about Elohim, and there are those who interpret it in the singular, those who interpret it in the plural. I leave the dispute to those who translate to those who are from that field, but in the Old Testament other deities are also spoken of, and this is a fact. In the Indian world it's a very different thing. For example, in the Indian world we don't find a myth of creation. Sumerians, Egyptians, Jews and Christians have a god who shapes clay and so on. For example, in the Indian world man has always existed, alternating from civilization to civilization and has never been created except in very remote times simply by the thought of the supreme being who by thinking man created man then there are many other myths and in fact here too a common mistake that is made about Hinduism is to define it as polytheism that is that many deities are worshipped in reality Hinduism is a henotheistic form. Shiva, Ganesh, Kali, all the deities, and there are those who have started to count them, there would be 33 million Indian deities. In reality, they are all the manifestation of the same supreme being, who shows himself in 33 million different ways. So this is Hinduism. 
It's divided into six darshanas, into six schools of thought. There is an atheist school, a hyper-religious, we could define it as a hyper-bigoted school. There are six main visions of the Indian world. So we have a world that is totally different from the one we generally know, or we can learn about Hinduism, unless we take a very academic or a very serious text that painstakingly makes us understand these differences. It's difficult to compare East and West, as Genon did, because they are two distant worlds, a bit like the colour of mourning in Japan. For them it is white, for us it's black. So sometimes there are great links, great points of contact, other times no. But this is also the beauty of the differences about the planet we live on. Another extremely interesting text is the Surya Siddhanta. The Surya Siddhanta is considered the oldest astronomical text in human history. It would have been donated, uh, the information that is contained dictated by the god Surya, therefore by the sun god, to ancient sages in India. And the incredible thing is a whole series of data, elements and knowledge that we find within it. First of all, for example, we can find a measurement of the Earth with a very low margin of error, which is close to the measurement that was performed at the beginning of the 20th century. Also within it, it talks about the Earth, Buloka, as a spherical planet, and that the universe, our galaxy, and here there is precisely the concept of many thousands of Shishuma, many galaxies, thousands of galaxies, that make up a universe that is extremely large, almost impossible to imagine and understand. But perhaps one of the most fascinating details that has been analysed and studied over the last, I would say, 30 to 40 years, but is still little known about, is what the Surya Siddhanta says about the routes that the deities took in our part of the galaxy to reach our planet. The first scholar to analyse this data was called David William Davenport. Davenport was born in India. He was the son of Lord Davenport, a family of tea landowners. He knew 14 languages, he read Sanskrit, he translated Urdu, Hindi, he knew many languages. Among other things, he lived for many years and died in Rome in Italy. In the last years of his life, he died in 1984, he had begun to study the Surya Siddhanta in great depth. I have his diaries, so with the various transcriptions, this very ancient astronomical text. And he had realised that beyond the stylistic anthologies, including poetic and religious ones, it clearly stated that one divinity rather than another, in order to arrive on our planet, needed first of all a Vimana, and therefore a means of transport. And this makes us understand how concrete these figures could be, and then that this vehicle had to make long journeys. It had to travel along routes in the galaxy to then reach our planet. And the Surya Siddhanta, for example, lists a whole series of star systems, therefore using a very modern concept, where habitable planets existed alongside the various suns. And a large concentration of these, where a good part of the various deities that we know of in India would have come from, for example, can be found in the area called Mariga Shiras, that is, the head of the antelope. It's a Sanskrit term meaning the head of the antelope. Obviously, it's an asterism, a group of stars, with possible planetary systems which is located near the constellation of Orion. And the constellation of Orion, we have learned, was fundamental for the Egyptians, for the Australian Aborigines, for various civilizations of South America, for the Sumerians themselves. And all these realities tell us how some of their divinities, if not the most important ones, came from the Orion area. Among other things, 
the Surya Siddhanta in Davenport studies and also in those that have been carried out even today, identifies an area near Maria Shiras with a solar system that has a very particular name. It is called Adra, and Adra in Sanskrit has two meanings, green or in a broad sense humid or wet. In the interpretation of some scholars, and Davenport was the first to tell us, perhaps it was known that in that solar system there could be a planet that allowed life to be born and exist. And the incredible thing is that we all know now that for almost 10 years we have been mapping and registering what are the extrasolar planets, therefore basically rocks which are not just the sun of a system, but also planets which may have an atmosphere and perhaps even liquid water. Here in this area called Mariga Shiras, Adra, near Orion, analysis and data from the last two or three years tell us that it is very probable that there are solar systems with planets in the right position to have water in the liquid state and therefore allow the possibility of hosting and sustaining life. And yet we find all this in the oldest astronomical text in human history. Obviously they are hypotheses, they are also inferences in the sense that they are theories that can be made, but it is stringent information. It is clear, dry and clean information in a text that is at least 2,000 years old. So we ask ourselves, how did they have all this information in such ancient times? Then there is the curious fact that these divinities should travel along these routes in a part of our galaxy and arrive here. Various star systems are indicated where there would be habitable planets but perhaps the most interesting and curious thing is that there are some points in this map that Davenport then recreated on paper, in which, according to the Surya Siddhanta, there are what are called gates or passages for the Vimanas. What does the Surya Siddhanta mean? It tells us that a Vimana that was travelling from the most remote areas and was approaching Buloka, approaching the Earth, or other areas that were of interest to it, could, in certain cases, enter these gates, these passages as they are called, and would find itself travelling a very long journey in much less time. And obviously, here there is a comparison with the modern world, and it is a bit like what, for example, Star Trek or many other science fiction films have introduced us to and taught us, that is, the warp drive the distortion of space-time which we know is possible on a theoretical level. That is, today in 2023-24, we know that this type of technology will be possible from a theoretical, even a practical point of view in the future, when we have the technology, but today we are unable to create it. And it's no more than an extension of Einstein's relativity. Therefore, science confirms it to us, theory confirms it, we find this data, which I think is unique in the history of civilization and human culture, in the oldest astronomical text in history, where it is precisely these Vimana, with on board the various divinities or devas, who, to speed up their journey, entered at one point and exited at another, covering enormously long distances. This obviously makes us understand how much here, too, in this text, there is a hidden fragment, a grain of sand, of a vast area that we still have to understand, to comprehend, know and study. But for me, it is also proof that these are not simple myths, legends or creations made by a poet of antiquity, but that behind many of these texts, of these traditions, there is a much more earthly and concrete background. So another very interesting myth that we find in the Indian world is that of the seven wise men, or Saptarishi. These seven wise men are basically the civilizers of the Indian people. 
tradition states that Manu, uh, the Indian Noah, following the coming of the Great Flood, when he saved the seeds of plants, animals, men and women, his main purpose, however, was to save knowledge, which in Sanskrit is called Veda, like their sacred text. And in order to save knowledge, he took the Saptarishi, the seven wise men, and made them board his boat. Then, after all the events, uh, a very long period in which the ship is tossed from side to side, it finally lands on the Himalayan chain. The waters recede, and when the land begins to be visible again, they all come out, and these wise men begin to move to bring civilization back among the survivors, even in very distant areas. This myth, this tradition, this legend is very interesting because it tells us about a flood of a previous civilization, of a new civilization that must be recreated for the Manusmriti, the laws of Manu. These characters were real characters, they were of flesh and bone, who would later be, much later, deified, precisely for this fundamental role of bringing civilization back to men. And the curious thing, however, is that we find this myth in many other areas of the planet, and this obviously raises questions. That is, is it legitimate for similar, even identical myths to develop in different areas of the planet? But when these myths are mirrored and totally identical, it's natural to raise some questions, and it's natural to look for answers. If we go among the Sumerian people, we find the myth of the seven Abkalu. The seven Abkalu are the civilizers of the Sumerian civilization. Tradition says that they arrived on board a luminous egg, as it's described, that, going down into the sea, would then bring out this being, this Abkalu, who is described in the tablets with having an anthropomorphic form, part man and part fish. And these Abkalu practically had the task of teaching the high dignitaries and the rulers of extremely ancient eras of Mesopotamia the rudiments of civilization, so how to irrigate the fields, how to cultivate, how to perform agricultural rotation, how to observe the sky and even the rudiments of mathematics. In fact, we know from archaeological discoveries of the last 10 years, from tablets that were found, where that which is the basis of all mathematics that would come later was inscribed. And in the Mesopotamian world, Sumerians first and foremost, then obviously also the Akkadians, it is said that there were seven of these wise men who brought civilization. The incredible thing is that it goes back to very ancient times and epochs. Even with the Sumerians, it reaches 400,000 BC, so, an era for us today in which man was not even a sapiens sapiens, but had yet to become so. If we move to Egypt, here too we have the seven wise men, whose story is told to us in the temple of Edfu, who are the civilizers of the Egyptian world. And also with Egypt, we see how even here the dates compared to our way of counting history are very different. Their Zero Dynasty begins around, we don't know precisely, but between 3000 and 3300 BC with the Scorpion King. But before, other divine and then semi-divine dynasties are spoken of, who are called the Neteru and the Shemsu Hor. So, the Neteru were the gods who ruled over men, and here too there is the Papyrus of Palermo and the Stele of Turin. There are a whole series of archaeological elements that tell us these stories. We are also talking here about extremely more ancient eras, in which, as they say, the divinities, the gods, walked among men, and then there were these beings, these figures, who were usually seven wise men who brought civilization. In India, all their traditions, at least some historical stories, date back to at least 20 to 30,000 BC. Then, obviously, one is free to say that these are just dates, improbable eras, that they are the ones who have set back in time some of their historical events. Others may believe this, 
However, if we look at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, which was buried around 9600 BC, in short, we can calculate that perhaps an advanced civilization may have actually existed 15 or 20,000 years ago. We also find this myth of the seven wise men in the Chinese world, in the Japanese world, we find it in South America. So, by connecting the dots a little, it seems that the story that emerges is that of seven figures who, for many peoples, were human, therefore of flesh and bone, but who were extremely advanced and progressed, and then various figures were deified, who almost always arrive after the end of the last glaciation, the event called the Flood, and help to recreate civilization. They restore knowledge, the rudiments of all those elements, those things necessary to start again from scratch. And this is curious, interesting, fascinating, because here too it shows us how Schlemann himself often started from a hypothesis, the story of the fall of Troy. It's not just a myth, but it may have been a historical fact. He started from this working hypothesis, which failed at first. Then he actually found, on the Hizalic Hill, the ancient city of Troy, as told of in the Homeric poems. The same is happening in the Indian world, both for their knowledge and for the civilizations that precede ours. Here too there is archaeological evidence, both for their traditions, which contain technological scientific knowledge, and data and information which would have been impossible to have in such ancient times, and which, at least in my opinion, necessarily presuppose that someone more advanced and progressed, and perhaps not necessarily of this planet, provided some of their wisest and most knowledgeable men. The concept of good and evil is a relative concept, the Devas today in Hinduism are divided between Devas and Azuras. The Devas are the good beings basically, and the Azuras are the bad ones, the, the demons. A very fascinating thing is if you look at Zoroastrianism in Afghanistan and Iran, the Azura are the good deities and the Devas are the bad ones. So it's like telling us there were two opposing factions of the same reality. But the point is that Devas and Azuras are both the same thing. The Azuras are Devas, they are deities who have more material purposes. They like food, they like wealth, they like women or men, they have more earthly interests. The Devas, as such, in the Indian world, are more evolved beings. They have abandoned or diminished materiality and dedicated themselves to higher things. The concept of good and evil is a relativistic concept, because in Hinduism, as in many religions, it is clearly said that it is right and it is fundamental that there is evil, because I cannot understand and I cannot appreciate what good means if I don't know what its exact opposite is. So it's a bit like yin and yang. I can only understand one thing if I understand and know its exact opposite. Obviously, wars and so on are human abomination and are extremes. However, it's a concept that is as simple as it is fundamental. And then there is a very interesting thing here that we also find in many other myths. That the Indian deities are not immortal. They can die. Krishna, at the end of the Mahabharata, dies because he is hit by an arrow on his heel, and the Yuga ends, the previous Indian era, and that Kali Yuga begins, which is the era according to the current Indian calendar. His death occurred in 3102 BC, therefore more than 5000 years ago according to Indian texts, and the Kali Yuga will last 432,000 years. So, apocalypses like 2012 in the Indian world are definitely a long way off. However, every Indian deity can die. They are beings who are always described as of flesh and blood who can be killed. 
the Azuras or Devas can be killed. Simply, they have an extremely longer life than according to our schemes and our way of measuring time. And this was also thanks to the use of certain substances, which are Amrita or Soma, which are the divine drinks that we also find in many other cultures that allow the prolonging of life for a very long time period. And a curious thing that is also linked a little to the Greek myths is that, for example, according to the Indian texts, one could distinguish a Deva, a divinity, one of these beings, when he was among men, because they almost always did not walk touching the ground, but they walked, according to the Indian traditions, a few centimeters from the ground, and their body did not cast a shadow. And this is another fact that we find in many traditions, in many civilizations, in many religious schools of thought that were born subsequently. But here too there is such curious particular data, even anomalous in its simplicity, that it can leave us thinking that perhaps there is something true behind their story and history. If I think that on the Earth, the planet Earth, 10, 20,000 years ago, there were, and this is a totally personal opinion based on years of research, but there were various realities, various realities that perhaps had divided the planet. Perhaps everyone had their own sphere of inference. I don't know. But the myths are so different that they tell us that probably in one area, India and the East, for example, there was a certain type of subjects. In other areas, such as Sumer, such as Egypt, there were other figures. In South America, still others. It is also dangerous for me to talk about a mother religion or a mother civilization. Personally, whether there have been or not, I think that there have, other civilizations before ours, I'm not thinking of Atlantis or Lemuria, I think there were various realities that were probably, or perhaps not, in contact with each other. They probably fought against each other, we can't know this, but a monolithic entity over the entire planet, well, that no. My opinion on where this knowledge can take us is by reacquiring something that is not ours, because we are talking about the East, therefore we are talking about realities and civilizations that are very distant from ours. However, I think that by carrying out the research seriously and correctly, we could actually discover a truly important piece of the history of our planet, which could perhaps help us understand part of our origins, and could also be helpful, today more than ever, to improve ourselves as people. Because, as in the West, in the East, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana and many other poems tell us about wars, but the epic poems, also such as the Mahabharata, they have the Gospel of the East, the Bhagavad Gita. That is, they teach us how wrong a certain type of attitude is, how a certain type of life path that our civilization, always in a hurry, always looking for money for the progress of technology, is losing many pieces. And the Bhagavad Gita, which was not initially part of the Mahabharata, it was inserted more or less in the 3rd century BC, is indeed a breaking point, because it gives a whole series of religious and spiritual teachings which are fundamental for Arjuna, but fundamental for anyone who, over the centuries and the millennia, has read the book. Where are we headed? Where will all this take us? Well, personally, I think that by returning to a genuine East, not the one that is sold to us today in the West, with gurus who gather thousands of people in sports stadiums, but by simply recovering, also by reading the Indian sacred texts, therefore by spending a few euros to buy their most ancient texts, which can be found in many languages, reacquiring that vision, that conception, that life path, can be of help. It's obvious that there will be those who will want to embrace it totally and will want to throw themselves headlong into that type of vision. We live in a Western world. We are surrounded by many things that are not Eastern, that hold us back. 
even towards an approach of this type, for which I think is the right balance between that knowledge, which is in many ways also similar to many philosophies closest to us. However, perhaps for me they have an edge in certain aspects that lead us to probe even more deeply into what we are or what we would like to be. Therefore, rediscovering India, the East in general, with a perspective free from fanaticism and factionalism can allow us to become and be better people, better spirits in today's world. And then, if karma exists, obviously for those who believe in it, to reincarnate and therefore bring, as they tell us, our cycle of lives towards the end, towards moksha, therefore towards the return to the original source.